welcome to Mr. Gordon Bolar. Um, Gordon is a retired manager of WMUK radio station, and he has a close friendship with Dave Isaiah. So we're excited to have him join us. And I think I will, Gordon, let you um, go ahead and share a little bit about your connection with Mr. Ise, and then you can take it from there. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, yes, uh, we have, I'm going to say we, that's Western Michigan University and WMUK and myself, have a long history with Dave Ise in this town. Dave is the founder of StoryCorps, uh, the author of the subject of today's book, you can see it, Callings, and he's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. Uh, I think six Peabody Awards, the Ted Prize Award in uh, 2015. And um, over the past 17 years um, or 18 or so, uh, StoryCorps has done transformative work. And I'm going to get back to that adjective a little later on. Um, there is a StoryCorps connection that runs deep and long with uh, Kalamazoo as well and with Western Michigan University and WMUK in 2007. Dave, we did the uh, residency in Bronson Park with the Airstream trailer. Then in 2012, I believe it was, we did the Military Voices Initiative here in the studios of WMUK on the campus of WMU. And then in 2015, we did the uh, residency that was out loud to capture the stories of the LGBT members of our community here. In, uh, in Kalamazoo. A long, rich history. It's so great to connect with you. Thank you for being with us here this morning. I'm just going to get right on into the book itself and say one of the first things that leaped out at me is the title of the book, Callings, the Purpose and Passion of Book of, of Work. And you call it, you entitle it Callings, Not Careers. And to me, that implies perhaps a higher calling or a calling to something higher within oneself in embracing a life's work. Indeed, hi, hi, and thanks everybody for joining. I'm in a hotel um, and I apologize if my Wi-Fi uh, isn't fantastic, uh, but it's great it's to good. be here. And, and, I, I, and I, I'm, I, I also wanna say, I, I hope it's okay that we have, our, our relationship was really forged um, uh, 14 or 15 years ago when yeah. we first came to um, Kalamazoo. And, you know, I think this this um, is, you know, a piece of, of callings. Um, we, you know, we've done a bunch of special initiatives through the years, uh, you know, with, and, and some of those appear in callings, you know, a 9-11 initiative, everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th, an African-American initiative. And it was a couple of days after our first trip to Western Michigan that um, you lost your son um, yeah. who was um, serving in Iraq. I think it was in May of 2007. Killed in um, action. Yeah, mm -hmm. Killed in action, uh, Matthew Bolar. And we at cre created an initiative uh, called the Military Voices Initiative, which um, has recorded thousands and thousands and thousands of stories with post 9-11 um, vets since then, in, in many ways in, in honor of and in memory of uh, uh, your son. So um, that was a um, that was really the first time that we got to know each other, and we've met many awesome. many times since then. Um, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, I think that um, Callings is a book. You, you know, just to for people who don't know what StoryCorps is, let me just wind back a little bit. Um, we um, were were a public service nonprofit. I did radio documentaries for decades before starting. StoryCorps, and for better or worse, I've always been a public service person uh, when it comes to radio. I know, Gordon, that's the same for, for yeah. you as well. It was never about entertainment. It was just about how, how you can do good for people using audio and radio. And I did documentaries for decades and then had this um, crazy idea, which is StoryCorps, which started in New York City, where we put a booth in Grand Central Terminal. You can bring anyone who you want to honor by listening to their story, a parent, a grandparent, to this booth, you bring them uh, to the booth, you're met by a facilitator, you go inside. Um, it's kind of a sacred space, the lights are low, you shut the door, you're in complete silence, it's you and your grandfather. And uh, for 40 minutes, you ask questions and you listen. And as Gordon well knows, the microphone gives you the license to talk about things you may not have ever spoken about before. So everyone from the beginning of StoryCorps thought of this as if I had 40 minutes, 
to live, what would I say to this person who means so much to me? And I think so much about StoryCorps is kind of a reminder of our mortality. Um, at the end of the 40 minutes, you get a copy and another one stays with us and goes to the Library of Congress so your great, 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 great grandkids can get to know your grandmother through her voice and story. Um, and it's always been about everyday people. Um, it's about the po poetry and power and grace and the stories hiding in plain sight all around us. It started as a crazy idea. It wasn't popular at first, but it got popular pretty quickly. We've now had about um, 650,000 people participate in Story Courts, the largest collection of human voices ever gathered. And because of the nature of, of the interviews, we're kind of collecting the wisdom of humanity. So yeah, I mean, I think that in callings, it, it, it is about people who have found, um, again, story, so much about StoryCorps is about wisdom. It's about, a lot of it is about the wisdom of elders, the wisdom of people who've been through difficult things. And um, these are people who find um, profound meaning in their work. Um, and, uh, you know, we edit, uh, we, we look at every story in the archive is equally valuable, maybe a sacred moment in people's lives, but there are some stories that almost demand that they be shared with a larger audience. And we went through the archive when we did this book, it, I don't know, it might have been six or seven years ago, and found you know meaningful stories about work um, out of the hundreds of thousands that we had um, recorded. And you know, just a geeky audio note, we don't do it based on the audio. We, you know, books are very different than radio stories. So we go back into the original transcripts and read them, you know, again, to find these, when, when we edit these stories, we think of them as little kind of poems of, of who we are um, that hopefully have a, sh a very long shelf life um, because, um, you know, they speak to eternal truths. And, you know, the, the, uh, the epigraph for uh, the book is the, um, that Mary Oliver line, tell me what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And it's about, you know, people making, fighting hard to find that thing that they were born to do and then doing it. Um, and those are the, you know, 50 or so stories in the book. Yeah, I notice um, in in the just looking at all of the stories in in my own life when I'm meeting somebody, what do you do? What was your life's work? What is your job? What are you retired from? In my case, is a great door opener and a great way to get to know something about the person. And we still, you know, we get a lot from all of these stories. I, I just am amazed by the sensory impressions of the various people, the forensics person who shaped skulls, you know, the tactile sense, the smell of the mole of the cook, the, the, the smell and the tool in dye shop. These smells, senses, sights, sounds, touch, pervade a life's work and bring back these memories. I was, I was struck by that when I read the book. Yeah, and, and again, um, I, I think that in some ways these are, poems, you know, and, 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 and when, and, you know, I think what, what it, it's an, it, it, in some ways it's, it's an odd book about work um, because, you know, nobody, there are no billionaires, there are no yeah. CEOs, no Titans. I mean, it's all just everyday people, but it's people who find this incredible richness in the work. And, and again, in many ways have this, you know, really poetic, powerful way of expressing you know what 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 that that work was. I mean, I, I remember, um, and and surprising also. You know, one story that um, that that I, I remember, um, and it's you know again there are kind of the big stories and the minor stories, um, but um, sometimes it's the smallest stories that are the most beautiful. You know, it's a guy who was who grew up. Um, the, if, if I'm remembering correctly, he was grew up in a family of coal miners for generations. They were coal miners and he was working at a gas station. And um, one day it just occurred to him that there was nothing he wanted to do more in the world than be a dentist. You know, it's just, and, and then, and, you know, and he's recording this, you know, 60 years after um, or 50 years after that moment. And still like every day, there's nothing he wants to do more in the world than go in and, you know, and, and work work on people's teeth and make them feel better, you know, and, and um, I don't know, there's just, it's, it's just, you know, we're surrounded, we're, sur we, we've talked about this before, but we're surrounded by so much kind of nonsense and, you know, and, and, and BS, and sometimes it's hard to tell what's real or not. And the beauty of StoryCorps, I think, is um, uh, that, um, that, you know, no, it's, it's the opposite of reality TV. No one comes to get rich or famous. It's just people 
coming out of generosity and love and telling the truth and telling their stories, telling truths that are true. I actually heard on um, on a, a public radio show on being, which I think is an excellent show. A couple of weeks ago, there was a minister talking about the fact that um, that uh, he he was talking about when um, Moses uh, is um, g goes to the burning bush and God tells him to take off his shoes. And the minister said he told him to take off his shoes because God was going to tell him the story, and that stories are sacred, you know. And 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 that was why the the uh, he was he was commanded to, you know, to to be barefoot, you know. And and there's some there's truth to it. I mean, I think there is a certain sacredness of in 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 stories and the act of of especially the act of listening to someone else's stories. Yeah, which reminds them that they matter and won't be forgotten. I think your work is really grounded in that. And I'm just going to hark back to something I saw in the introduction that I, you tell me, I believe this person is an influence on, on your work and, and certainly on this. And that's Studs Terkel. And when he's there in Grand Central Station and you're setting up one of the first booths of the first booth back, you know, after uh, 2001, 911, he says, we know the name of the person who built this great hall, this great building. We don't know the story, though, of the person who mops the floors every night. And that is interesting. The person around you that's not the great, you know, the billionaire, the industrial tycoon, but this everyday person that you encounter. Yeah, I, I mean, that that was, you know, he threw down the gauntlet and said, you know, these are the stories that you must tell through StoryCorps. And we've worked hard to live up to that. Studs was in his mid-90s when we opened the booth and flew to New York from Chicago to be with us. He's since... Um, passed on. And for those, you know, it's uh, when I give talks uh, and I talk about studs many times, you know, now people don't know who he was, um, but um, he was a great oral historian. He, you know, one of the influences for StoryCorps were the WPA oral histories, which he participated in um, uh, before World War II. Um, he didn't do recordings. He did um, written oral histories, but um, and of course, he was a well-known radio personality, but more than anything, he was incredibly generous and he believed in in our stories, the stories he he called, um, you know, he talked about. To, to me, the what's so interesting about StoryCorps, I think, is the passing down of these stories from generation to generation. But there's also, you know, a historical piece to this. I mean, this comes with, um, you know, the work we did with Matthew documenting, you know, post 9/11 wars. Studs used to talk about, you know, bottom-up history that we always hear history from, you know, from statesmen and politicians and so forth, but there's an incredibly visceral, powerful, rich history to be told through the voices of just regular people like us um, talking about our lives and, and how we intersected with um, with moments of history. I know, you know, one thing, I, I don't know if everybody finished the book or read the book, but, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I think of, I hope, I, I'm, I hope I'm not giving it away for the people who haven't finished the book, but the last line in the book, if I'm not mistaken, is a granddaughter who interviews her grandfather about his career. And um, at the end of it, she says, um, Grandpa, do you have any um, advice for me? And he says, just three words, live with courage, you know? And, and, and you know, that, that in, that's, that's kind of all you need to know in, in, in life. And it's, it's you know, I, I think in some ways that's the essence of StoryCorps. Again, lessons for us, a path for us to follow, um, to live full, rich lives. And in this case, um, rich work lives. Well, one of the questions that I had, which probably you just answered, is uh, are there any lessons here for young people who are considering career paths? Maybe they're enrolled at, you know, a university like Western Michigan University. Uh, anything that they could draw from this? And you just said, you know, live your life with courage. Um, I don't know. You, you may have some observations based yeah, on... No, I, look, I think different people, obviously, you know... <laughs> It's a complicated time we're living in, you know, the, yeah. and, and, you know, there's uh, he, he, people come out of, of college with student debt and, and uh, tremendous student debt. And there are pressures around the, the work environment and, you know, questions of privilege and so forth. But, you know, I think that the, the lesson from this, you know, you see a lot of people in this book who go down one route for a career and realize it's not what they were meant to do and then choose another one often, which is not you know, nearly as, as lucrative. You know, there's a woman who I was, I don't, I think she was, um, her name's Barb Abelhauser, and she was working a corporate job and 
decided that all she wanted to do in the world would be a bridge tender was to sit in a booth on a bridge and you know and and be there when she needed to lift the bridge or have it go down she's still doing it to this day um and quit that job to do this thing um and you know i think you hear from um uh a bunch of times in this book people saying i, I don't want on the day i die for me to you know say uh i wish i you know i wish i hadn't done this. I wish I had taken a different route. So I, I think that, you know, I, 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 from, from this volume of, of stories we have, again, the largest collection of human voices ever gathered, there's a lot of wisdom about work. And um, I, I think that we all have this inner voice in us, which knows kind of what we're meant to do. And if you are able to follow that, um, if you're able to follow that inner voice and find that thing you are meant to do, then um, you know, give it everything you've got and fight with everything you've got to do that thing, um, and and that, you know, from from these interviews, I think, tends to lead to a very meaningful work life. Dave, one question I want to ask you. I've always kind of wondered this, um, and and it's and maybe it's a personal question, but you seem to have kind of a, a radar or a predilection for looking around just in your own life and the people you encounter and wondering, asking, recording the, their stories. And I know how you started off. You had a med school, uh, you know, you're on your way to med school and then you recorded the story of these two people who were addicts. But personally, you know, you captured the story of the OG BYN nurse, you know, who's at present at the birth of one of your children. Um, you just look around you at the world and see, boy, there's a story there. How, how do you do that? Where did where did that come from? And for, for for you? Well, I don't. You, you know, I don't. I don't do many. I did. I did the interview. The the inspiration for Callings was um, the doctor who delivered both of our kids, um, yeah. uh, uh, Doctor Chen. Who um, and I did an interview with her. I don't get a chance to do that many interviews. Okay. Um, but I do. You know. But but I I, I I do work on the selection of stories every week that we put on. MUK that we put on NPR. And yeah. um, uh, first of all, I think, um, what, well, to me, these are just the stories that are interesting. You know, I don't, I don't really watch TV. You know, I, I just find the stories of, you know, the, of us again, like there's a, a real thrill for me to hear that, to be able to take a real moment from real life that's stirring and, and captured and put it on the radio. Um, and to me, you know, these are these are the stories that that matter, um, that that touch me, that speak to me, and they always have since I was a kid. Um, so maybe it's it's a little bit um, weird, but I, I just I've never been that interested in you know what we were talking about before the celebrity you know stories. It just doesn't interest me. Uh, maybe I have a nose. My dad was um, uh, like very much not was had a real nose for phonies and and I think I do too and it's just not interesting to me so um again just 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 you know seeing the beauty in in everyday life is has always been kind of thrilling to me uh and all it takes is listening you know I was um I did I made radio documentaries for decades as you know before starting StoryCorps and you know I think there was part of me that and and I I was pretty good at it um and I think there was part of me that thought that you know, there was something about me. There was like, a, like I had this magical ability to listen or ask questions to create these like great radio documentaries or good radio documentaries. And once StoryCorps started, which is really just about us asking questions of each other, of our parents, of our grandparents, I realized within days that it had nothing to do with me, that we're all capable of doing these, this listening and asking these questions and having these really intimate moments with people who matter to us and getting to the heart of, you know, what's important in life. You know, I think in, in some ways, uh, as I said earlier, StoryCorps just reminds us of our mortality, which gets back to, you know, the the relationship that you and I have. And and in some ways, I think of StoryCorps, my, my communications people hate when I talk about this, but it has a lot in common with hospice, you know, um, uh, and, and, and hospice work. Uh, the people who come to StoryCorps aren't actively dying, but, you know, they people talk about with hospice that there are four things you want to say to people uh, before they die. Thank you. I love you. I forgive you and forgive me. Um, and in many cases, that's the conversation 
that sense of closure that happens in the booth with a loved one. Again, you have the permission to say the things and ask the things that really matter. And all of us are aware when we do these story core interviews that our great, 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 great grandkids are going to listen to them. I mean, this is this is this authentic kind of way of capturing as best possible who we are as a human being, what we've how our, our work life, who we've loved, what we care about, the big questions in life. Um, and, you know, I think that they're going to be incredibly valuable for future generations to listen to. That's one of the joys of this, you know, effort that we just don't know what this is going to mean in 100 years or 200 years. Well, my sense of uh, when I when I look at your work is that you're tapping into a basic human need. And, and I think that's evidenced in one of the stories that I just like to quote from here. And it's the story of the two sanitation workers out driving their garbage truck. And one of them says, this one old lady, she's around 75 years old. She really don't have nobody to talk to. So when we come to the block, she would be waiting for Angelo because he would talk to her. And that, you know, that to me um, is indicative of this, the core of, of what you're about. That is a basic human need to be heard, to listen to to be listened to and to, to listen, even though it's not her story that's embraced, but these guys on the garbage truck, they pick up on that. They know that. Yeah. Well, that, you know, I always, I, I feel like we're too far down the road with StoryCorps now to change the name, but I've always thought the name was wrong since very early on, because it's really not about storytelling. It's about listening. And, you know, being listened to reminds people that they matter and they won't be forgotten, which is all any of us really wants to know. So in many ways, this 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 whole effort of StoryCorps is, is just an act of an act of listening. Um, and, you know, I have I actually I, I we, we talked a couple of days ago and I know you were going to mention the story of the two sanitation workers. And I think especially because there's been a lot of focus on, you know, frontline workers, um, workers yeah. who kept working through the pandemic. Um, and and I and and you know we've been talking over the last couple of days about at StoryCorps, just like we did the 9/11 initiative, doing a massive initiative on on front on on frontline workers during the pandemic who will have gone through incredible um, PTSD. Uh, but I I I I'm I'm gonna I'll play the um, story of the two sanitation workers with with your permission and share Please. with people, and then maybe we can go to um, yeah. questions. So let's um, let's do that. I had this all set up and then I screwed it up. But let me, um, let's see if we can get this set up again here. Hold okay, on. all right. We'll airing and you can see a little of my kids that Dr. Chen delivered and okay. Everybody would just come out just to talk to you. People would say, oh, good morning, Angelo. Good morning, Eddie. You want a cup of coffee? You want lunch? And the nuns kissing us, too. We got nuns on the route. You know, I never had that before. <laughs> the younger guys would ask me, how did you get that? It's just a little good morning. Have a nice weekend. Hey, you look great today. I can do 14 tons of garbage. I can't lift a baby carriage off a step and carry it down or hold someone's baby when they went to get their car. The garbage ain't going nowhere. You know, the garbage will be there a half hour from now, an hour. So when you get it, you get it. He made a statement one day that he does all the work and I do all the talking. It came out wrong. Look how he's getting at it. It just came out wrong. I did it. <laughs> when I first came on the job, there was one old time I remember Gordy Flo, his name was. One day he stopped the truck. He tells me, Angelo, you look down this block first. See all the sidewalks are all crowded up with garbage. So I didn't think nothing of it. My father always told me to respect my oldest. I get to the end of the block. And he stops me again. Get out of the truck. Look back. Nice and clean, right? People go walk on a sidewalk. Guys can make deliveries. Be proud of yourself. The day that people learned that you were going to retire, we went maybe a block or two blocks, and six people came up to him saying, you're crazy. What am I going to do when you leave? I'm a little bit of a marshmallow anyway, but I never thought my last day would be so emotional for me. He's crying. They're crying. I'm crying watching them cry. 
I've been very lucky because uh, he's the best partner I ever had. We used to try to take the same vacation and try to have the same day off. And uh, I miss my partner. I feel the same way, Eddie. I'll be honest with you. I, I miss it terribly. I'm like that little kid looking out the window now when they hit a truck. I think I could have done another 31 years. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Um, you know, one of the words that I used at the introduction here is uh, transformative. And I say that, I'm not the first person to say it. I probably got it from, from you or someone else, but there is a transformative uh, event when you go into that booth and you listen to someone. My wife and I did it. She's here uh, beside me, Ellie. And um, it is a moment that transforms both, both the, uh, the, the teller of the story and the listener and those who hear it through the PBS or WGVU or before nine o'clock here or on WMUK, you know, after eight o'clock, 8.20 on uh, Friday mornings. It is a transformative event and transformative work that you're doing, Dave. Thank you so much uh, for being here with Thank us. And uh, I, I don't know if you have anything else to say before we take some questions. And, uh, I, I just want to say that it's not that it's that there's a whole large, large group of people who work on StoryCorps who are deeply committed to the work and, you know, and partners like MUK, like you over all the years, you're, you know, it's the people who participate. It's the, you know, the, the staff who works there and more than anything else, the people who participate, who give the effort life, you know, and again, it's very counter to so much of kind of what's going on in the world right now. Um, it's hopeful. Um, and uh, it reminds us of, of who we are at our best and shows us a path of how to live a good life. Um, and we're going to keep telling those stories as, you know, in the same kind of spirit of so many of the stories and callings, you know, we'll, we'll keep fighting to tell these stories until, you know, until the last breath is, is out of our bodies. Well, keep fighting the good fight then. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I'm going to entertain some questions if we have it. I think... Uh, Carolyn Smith of uh, WMU uh, Alumni Relations is uh, standing by with perhaps some questions for Dave. I am, thank you. I, uh, we did have some questions submitted, Dave, from the registrations from our guests. So I will, sure. there are too many to get to all of them. So we'll try to combine a couple. And I know some of them are about specific stories. So we'll try to avoid some of those, but I, one of the questions that was submitted, and just because you played um, the animation, someone wondered how the stories that get animated are selected. Are those sure. just sure. favorites? Um, thanks, thanks. thanks for the great story. So uh, question, and you can find our animations. Again, they play on PBS, they're on the web. You can find it on our website, storycore.org. So we, um, as I said, we've recorded about 650,000 uh, inter, uh, peop, about 650,000 people have recorded StoryCorps interviews. And all of them we see as equally valuable as hopefully an important or sacred moment in people's lives. Some of them demand to be shared with a larger audience. So there's all kinds of data that goes to the Library of Congress about these interviews. But one piece that stays with us are the facilitators um, who do the face-to-face -face interviews, who bear witness to these interviews, have a section in the metadata uh, about broadcastability where they rate a story for again, that kind of poetry, that that universality, um, and uh, again, it says it says nothing about the experience people had. It doesn't matter to us, um, but it does help us select the stories. Um, those go to a production. Nobody sees those ratings except our production team, and they listen to lots of stories. We edit about one four hundredth of one percent of what comes in, uh, and that goes on the radio um, every week. Again, these little three minute um, uh, poems that hopefully have you know are have will be relevant hundreds of years from now um and then out of those we choose a few you know i don't know maybe a tenth of those end up getting animated um and we do uh, i don't know 10 or 11 or 12 52 broadcasts a year and 10 11 or 12 animations a year of those stories so that's kind of the funnel that leads to the um to the animations we love that one that's one of our favorites the sanitation workers so um I, another question came in just a, a little while ago about the populations that have done this. And I know Gordon's participated in the military voices. I know, and I'll send some links to people who registered 
because there was uh, one with the LGBT community in Kalamazoo a number of years ago as well. But there was a question about whether um, men and women who have been in the penal system have participated in StoryCorps. Yeah, well, every, I mean, it's 650,000 people. So every possible human being in the United States um, has participated. Yes, we've done a lot of stories of people who um, have been incarcerated. Uh, we've done, you know, stories with um, with um, uh, people who work in the prison system, lots of incarcerated stories. We're working with the Innocence Project now to do many stories of people who had been wrongfully convicted. So yes, many, many of those stories. Again, the, um, the uh, you know, in, in some ways this, this, you know, when you come to StoryCorps, you record a story, you become part of American history. It goes to the Library of Congress. And people who have been, you know, where society tells them that maybe their lives don't matter, I think there's a particular significance to participating in something like StoryCorps. So we do a lot of work to make sure that the whole swath of, of um, the widest possible swath of this country uh, gets the opportunity to be part of the, of the project, that we have the honor of of um, listening and recording them and sharing their story for future generations. Half of our story, half of our interviews um, in these, you know, we have mobile booths that travel the country. As Gordon said, these Airstream trailers, half of the story, half of the interviews are held for people who might've heard of us on MUK, your local public radio station in the newspapers. The other half, we work with um, all kinds of community organizations, uh, um, homeless services, uh, immigrants groups, um, juvenile justice uh, groups who tell the people that they serve about StoryCorps and those folks come in um, with a loved one if they want to and record their story for American history. So that's kind of how we get that that wide um, breadth of, of stories. The book had me wanting to ask my own family stories over the holidays. So Good. Well, I hope I you know. We, during the pandemic, we created we every single interview that we'd done at StoryCorps up until the pandemic had been face to face, and we had to pivot really quickly when the pandemic hit. And we created something called StoryCorps Connect, um, which you can look up and find StoryCorps Connect, which is a digital bespoke bi digital platform that makes it possible to record stories um, remotely with loved ones. And I think especially at this moment, where elders feel may feel really isolated. Um, you know, that taking an hour and doing this interview can be really meaningful. So I encourage people and you um, to go to um, StoryCorps Connect and, and um, make an appointment to do one of these with, with a loved one. You don't need a facilitator. You can do it anytime. And every interview goes to the Library of Congress. You look the people face to face on your computer and, and hit record and it all um, is preserved for the future. And it's a very, very similar experience to face to face interviews. That's awesome. Have you, uh, I'm gonna throw in one of my own questions and then I'll get to one other one. But I wondered, um, I assume many of these have had to be done remotely throughout this year. Has that changed anything? Yeah. Is, is, do you notice a difference or does anything surprise you about having it done remotely rather than face-to-face? Well, I think, you know, our, our tech team who did just did a remarkable job of pivoting and creating this new platform within, you know, weeks of when the pandemic hit. I think what surprises me is the fidelity with which these are done. You know, it's very, very close to the experience of doing a face-to-face -face interview. Um, you know, we, you can see the person who you're talking to, just like I'm seeing you. Um, we don't, we don't save that. We save only the audio and snapshots that are taken during the interview automatically. Um, so it's really still just the voice, but I think that um, the team, you, you know, the, the team did a, a really good job of uh, kind of recreating digitally the experience of a StoryCorps interview using remote. And again, we have no choice. I think the fact that the stakes are so high right now, and again, when we talk about, you know, the how StoryCorps reminds us of our mortality, this is a moment when we're reminding us you know, we're reminded all the time of our mortality. So um, I think I think the fact that the stakes are so high that people want to make sure that they have a chance to leave a record, that, that there's this, you know, real profound need to connect uh, has all led to, you know, Story Connect, I think, being a really, um, you know, powerful way for people to record stories. And, you know, people are, I guess, forgiving and and I, I, from what I can see from the surveying we've done and, and the work we've done evaluating the service that it's, you know, it's very, very similar to a face-to-face -face interview. Um, and I think people are just grateful that they have the chance to do this with someone at such a difficult time. 
Absolutely. I know I promised Gordon we'd be respectful of your time, so I won't keep you much longer, but just to so that you can give us some final words, there was a question about lessons you've learned or what's the most unusual pearl of wisdom that you've learned as part of this project? Well, there have been many unusual stories. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that that's, uh, I mean, just you can imagine out of all the stories we've had, I mean, everything you can imagine, hilarious, crazy, funny stories. Um, Gordon knows the, um, the, you know, one that, um, the, a woman in from uh, who's who was 90 years old talking about like an inflatable bra she had gotten as a kid and she went up in a non-pressurized plane and the bra started expanding and exploded you know just like crazy stuff you can, again you can't you can't make this stuff up in terms of the wisdom you know I think that um, the, the what what you get out of StoryCorps are eternal truths you know and you know it's not hallmark it's not corny they're just true. Uh, and their truths about what makes a good life and how we treat others, you know, um, you know, to always assume the best in other people and, and none of us are the worst things we've ever done. All these kind of things we know, but are just reinforced by StoryCorps. So the, the truths aren't, are, are, there, there are, are the ones that you know, if you're listening and, and paying attention, um, to life, um, the story, and 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 they're not there's there, there's not really odd truths. There's nothing that won't make complete sense to you when you think about it. But the stories themselves are can be you know off the uh, off the charts wacky. And the and the same, but the same truths come out of those wacky stories. Well, Dave, I want to thank you for being with us today, and it's great to reconnect with you. And thank you. For, for the work that you do, but especially for the long and deep connection that we, and I say the Kalamazoo community, myself, WMU, WMUK have had with you and StoryCorps throughout the years. I know it's certainly enriched my life and I know the lives of so many people that it has enriched already and your work will continue to enrich and transform as you move about the country. Thank you so much for sharing what you've shared today. Thanks. Thanks, Gordon. As, as you know, I mean, I'm not in my office today, but if I was, I could turn my computer around and um, show a picture of Matthew, which I keep, keep up on my, um, in front of my um, desk to um, remind me about why we do this work and what's important. And I appreciate your friendship over all these years. And please give Ellie a hug for me as well. I will. She's right here. Thank you so much, Dave. Okay. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Okay. I'll throw it back to uh, you, Carolyn, and and or Hardy and WMU Relations and continue to, to listen to this uh, wonderful discussion about callings. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Be well. Thanks, Bye -bye. Dave. Bye-bye, Dave. Well, Hardy, we'll turn it on over to you then. Yeah, you're muted, Hardy. <laughs> um, it was the first thing I was... I said, I'm going to keep it muted. It's not the first time I do that. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Gordon, thank you very much for uh, interviewing Mr. Isay, the collaboration between the WMU Alumni Association and WMUK through you is appreciated. Thank you. It was a wonderful interview. But as part of this program, <laughs> we also wanted to bring one of our own um, to join us and to talk about his passion for work. Um, Jim Hickey is uh, with us here today. And uh, Mr. Hickey is uh, a member of the Alumni Book Club. And when I saw his name and he saw a, I saw a posting as part of this book club, uh, I said, what a wonderful story he wrote about his family and how his family influenced him um, on what he had done for so many years. Before I ask Mr. Hickey uh, the first question, um, I want to introduce him formally. And uh, Mr. Hickey is a 32 year veteran of ABC News Radio. He has been a national and international correspondent. He has received a number of awards uh, for, his, for his work, uh, but more important to me, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hickey, uh, 
you received the Distinguished Alumni Award from the WMU Alumni Association, and you have also uh, received a, um, a honorary degree from Western Michigan University. And I appreciate that you are taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Hardy. Um, I think I need to uh, be unblocked. My video is uh, uh, blocked because the host has, so you can hear me, <laughs> but you can't see me at this point. But that it's is, good to be with you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, we are... Um, uh, there there we you are. are. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Uh, good to see you again. Huh? Good to see you. So I wrote, I saw the post in the 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 the, the, the written story that you uh, answer about the question regarding the book about the impact of your family in your success. Can you share with our uh, uh, friends from the book club that story? Sure. First of all, I think Callings is a fabulous book, and I I congratulate Dave for the work he's doing with StoryCorps. And uh, I was unaware of StoryCorps Connect, and I wrote a note to myself because I'm going to talk to my granddaughters about StoryCorps Connect. I think that's a great idea. My story actually began at Western Michigan University when I was a freshman, way, way back in 1964. And I started working at WIDR. Sorry, Gordon, it wasn't WMUK, it was WIDR. But <laughs> I, um, and in my later years, and I've lectured a few college classes now about media, and one of, one of the pieces of, pieces of advice I always give students is pay attention to who you meet and who you associate with in school, whether it's a student, a professor, um, a, uh, a, a uh, college president, it doesn't matter because you never know who is going to be important to you in later years. Well, it just so happens there was a fellow student at WIDR, a fellow by the name of Henry Erb, who was a year older than me, and he worked in the news department at the campus radio station. In fact, he was the news department. He convinced me to come to work with him because as a freshman, I was a disc jockey. My first ever, ever radio gig was a 12, p 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. jazz program. So you can kind of figure out what my class load was like the first semester. But I played jazz so students could listen and, and study, allegedly. Anyway, the next semester I went to work with Henry in the news department, and he taught me the basics of journalism, the when, why, who, where, how, and what, and all of that. And we went around campus covering stories, campus stories. He taught me how to write, how to cover a story, and I discovered that was my calling. That was what I wanted to do. It just hit me full, full blast at that time as a freshman. So I began taking communication courses. Time goes on. I start, I was hired, fortunately, in my junior year as a writer for WKZO in Kalamazoo. And I started working as a reporter. Uh, by the time I was a senior, at Western, I was anchoring the 11 o'clock news on the weekends on the TV side at WKZO. And I was doing so much work in the street and at the broadcast studio that I actually cut my hours back at school and became a part-time student. That's why my graduation year is 1969 instead of 1968. But I graduated with a BA in communication, well, actually speech. We didn't have a comm degree then and political science. But in the meantime, I was, I was hooked. I was on my way on this calling, this career. Now, here's where my family came in. My dad was, God bless him, he passed away many years ago, but he was always very supportive of me and everything I did. He always said to me, it's your life. You have to make your own decisions. Not that I will always agree with them, but they are your decisions and you have to live by them. So when I became involved in television, he wasn't quite sure about this career choice. This was way back in the 60s. Television at that time was in its, in, well, let's say it's adolescence at that point. And he wasn't convinced that the TV was going to be a going thing. Uh, it was still black and white, little seven inch or maybe 13 inch screens. And he wasn't sure this was a proper choice as a lifelong career. And he 
being a depression child, my father was, let's see, he was uh, 19, actually 21 years old uh, during the depression. So he was a young man when this, in this country's worst economic period and he struggled. He, well, he was uh, second of nine children. He had to leave his house when he was a young man in order to reduce the number of mouths his parents had to feed. He had to fend for himself from the time he was a teenager until the time I was born. And so he knew the value of working with his hands. He knew the value of manual labor. Actually, he would have been a good subject for Dave to interview or to be a part of the story core. As my father's story of his growing up was, was just incredible. So he wasn't convinced TV was, the, was going to be the thing and that he always advised me, learn a, learn a trade, learn to become an electrician or a carpenter or a plumber or something that you can do with your hands, Jim, just in case this TV thing doesn't work out. And of course, being a young, smart, Alec teenager, I said, oh, sure, Dad, I'll think about that, no problem. And he said, no, I'm serious. And he kept reminding me as my, as my career advanced and I was working for larger TV stations and my career was, was beginning to take hold. Every year he would ask me, have you decided to go to night school yet? Have you decided to uh, learn to become an electrician or a carpentry and all that? And I kept saying, I'm, I'm, I'll keep that in mind, sure. You know, of course I never did. 15 years later, Hardy, 15 years later, I'm now working at KYW Television in Philadelphia, which was a major league TV station, the fifth largest market in the country. My dad comes to visit me one weekend and I give him a tour of the TV station. I showed him everything in the newsroom, in the control room, in the studio, uh, in the offices upstairs. I even took them downstairs into the basement to show them the boilers because my dad knew boilers. That night, we were at a restaurant having dinner and he was uncharacteristically quiet during dinner. And I asked him if there was something wrong. And he said, no, I'm just sitting here thinking. And I said, what about? He said, all that stuff you showed me today at the TV station, can you do all that stuff? And I said, well, I have, let's say I have a working knowledge of most of it, but yeah, I, I, I suppose I could. And he goes, huh, well, Jim, I guess you don't have to go to night school after all. Eureka. It only took him 15 years, but he reached that point. But he never said I couldn't do what I wanted to do. He always said, you can do whatever it is you want to do, except I'm just not sure that's what you should be doing. But uh, I went on to work for the network and had a wonderful career, spent 32 years as a correspondent for ABC News. 10 of those 32 years was overseas as a foreign correspondent covering wars and insurrections. I was a bureau chief in South Africa during the time of apartheid, and it was a wonderful experience. And uh, I thank Western Michigan University for giving me the foundation for that career. I thank Henry Erb, the student. I thank our Franklin Smith and Jules Rossman, two of my professors. And I thank my father for having some doubts, but in the end, believing in me. Oh, that's a wonderful story. And I, I, um, I have to confess that uh, uh, that's what I was, uh, uh, hoping for you to share with all of us that personal touch uh, with your father and your story uh, through Western and through your 32 plus years on, on, on the news. Um, if may I ask one more question? Of course. Uh, with all your life experiences, with all your travels and all the news that you have covered all over the world, do you remember uh, some of the most uh, passionate moments of your career, a, a, a particular story, a particular place, uh, or a moment in history that you will say, that touched me, that made me better, or I am more passionate about what, 
what I am doing because it make me make, uh, make a difference? Yeah, that's a really good question, Hardy. And a lot of how I can answer that goes back to the project that David's been working on all these years at StoryCorps, and that is interacting with people. And that's what my career has allowed me to do is interact with all different kinds of people around the world. I've reacted, been able to interact with really good people and some really awful people. And I've been able to see the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. I saw some atrocities in, in Lebanon. I saw some atrocities in, in Russia. I saw some atrocities in South Africa. I saw really good things in all those places as well. I would say though, to be really, to give you a really specific answer, I would have to say it was covering the downfall of apartheid in South Africa. I spent four years direct, in that time, it was in the late eighties when South Africa basically was in flames. Uh, that's when the townships were burning and there was this great revolution against this uh, government policy of racial segregation and uh, led to the end of apartheid. There were a lot of moments that happened. Um, a lot of moments dealing with, and I'll tell you about two of them, that were, two of them that were especially memorable for me. I got to know Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu quite well while I was in South Africa. He was a vocal opponent, as you know, of apartheid and was well known for his, his uh, fiery rhetoric and he was a very brave man. And I would interview him often, sometimes not on camera, but sometimes just sit down and talk with him. He was instrumental in negotiating the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. As you know, Mandela spent 27 years in prison. Um, I was at Tutu's house one day, uh, just him and me, no camera crew. I had just gone to his house just to chat and to get an update on how the negotiations were going for Net Mandela's release. And we sat and chat, chatted informally in his living room. He lived in Soweto, the township, the black township just outside Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. While we were talking, his phone rang. He goes into the other room to answer it and I can hear him talking on the phone and I hear him getting more and more excited as he's speaking, he hangs up and he comes bustling back into the living room and his eyes were like bright and glistening and he raises his hands in the air and he says, Nelson's coming home, Nelson's coming home. He had just gotten word, the official word, that agreement had been reached and that date and time had been set for Mandela to be released from prison. He started dancing around his living room. He was so happy and it was just him and me. There were no cameras to record this. And I'm sitting there watching them, watching him, really amused by all this. And he reaches down, he grabs my arms, pulls me up out of the chair. Now we're both dancing around his living room. Because <laughs> Nelson Mandela is coming home from prison. Uh, that was uh, in a moment that, that my heart just sang for him, for Mandela, and for the thousands of Africans who would be rejoicing within a matter of days that Mandela came home. The second memorable moment that is connected to that, I was privileged to be outside Mandela's home the day he came home from uh, prison, the day he arrived at his home in Soweto for the first time in more than two decades, two and a half decades. And that was really an emotional time for that, uh, the, the reception that he got from the people of Soweto, the people of Johannesburg was overwhelming. and. You know, that was worth all four years of tasting tear gas, dodging bullets, and seeing the, the drama that I experienced in South Africa. Uh, I could be all day listening to those stories. <laughs> if we put Gordon, Dave, and Jim together, I think the three of you can take fill one day of stories for everything that you have done in your life. But we have only one hour. We have reach our end we don't want uh we promise our uh guest uh to uh that this was going to be a one hour program as is anything else you want to you want to say uh to to everyone jim well it's just 
just listening to Dave talk, I was struck by his his wisdom from the story core, you know, and, and Gordon, you made the point that these people telling these stories are not famous. They're not government leaders. They are people. They are real people. And I just jotted down construction workers, custodians, cashiers, linemen, climbing poles, carpenters, truck drivers, airplane mechanics, baggage handlers. These are the people who make this country run. They are the people who are really important when it comes down to it. And I congratulate Dave for writing this book or for collecting this book. And, and I congratulate you guys for uh, this presentation. And Gordon, good work to you too, sir. Thank you, Jim. Good to be a part of this today, Hardy. I'm pleased to reconnect with all, everyone and especially to bring uh, Dave's uh, insights uh, to the discussion of this wonderful book. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, uh, Mr. Hickey, I hope we can see you back on campus uh, sometime after all this is over and uh, continue the conversation.